Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to cover my new multi-group confirmatory factor analysis assignment. It's not really new so much as this version shows you how to run a multi-group model without using any extra packages. So over the years, I've taught this using SEM tools that used to have a very cool measurement and variance function and uh, disappeared it. And then I've also taught this with equal test MI, which has a great function that you can only get to work half the time um, from the, all of the emails that I've gotten. So now I'm just going to do it in straight Levon. Like you can do this without any extra packages um, and test a multi-group model. Those additional tools sometimes just make it a little bit faster or easier, but I think it's useful to know just how to like do this. I don't want to say by hand because I mean, we're writing code, but how to do this without any of those extra packages. So when they don't work for you, you have a backup plan. And this is how I taught it this semester in my class. So for my class, here we go. And what we did in the class was we looked at the resiliency 14 scale and we examined the multi-group analysis using um, gender. So for this example, now we're going to do that same thing, but look at ethnicity. And the RS14 is a resiliency scale with 14 items. So let's import that data set. So to import that data set, I'm going to use the Rio library, which is fantastic. I'm going to say, okay, my master data set is where I can say my uh, resiliency data, okay, is import and then assignment multi-group CFA. Let's look at what's in that data set. Okay. And we see sex that we used last time, ethnicity, and then our 14 items. Okay. Another thing I'm going to load here is Levon. And I don't think I have ex um, a whole lot of diagrams in this model because we've done a bunch of diagrams. But if you wanted to diagram, you could also use simplot. So first thing first, um, let's clean up the um, variable here because it is currently labeled as 0, 1, 2. Okay. And so what we want to use is, I have it as 1 is black and 2 is white. So we're actually going to drop the 0 category. That's cool. So let's say res data dollar ethnicity equals factor res data. I'm just going to overwrite the original column because if I screw it up, I can just reload the data set. For our levels, we want to include um, 1 and 2. I'm going to ignore 0. It's going to drop that, make it in A. And then for our uh, labels, we're going to do black, comma, white. Okay. And they should be in the same order as the levels here. Now if I run that table one more time, just to look at it, I can see that it, it has dropped that label. It's not actually dropped. You can add this use in a if any code. Um, they've just become missing data points. Okay. Now, Levon usually ignores this missing data, but just in case, I could also just say, you know what? I don't want to even deal with any missing data. Drop it all. Now, if I run this again, I see that I pretty much have the same data points, so I didn't have any missing data somewhere else. So let's just see, make sure we have enough data points really um, on our data set. 459 is a pretty good number for a, a structural equation model. That's just some data cleanup. Now, can I leave it as one and two? Yeah but then the output labels are not very helpful. So it's always best to name them based on what they actually are. All right, so from there, let's create a one factor model. Okay, we're gonna call this overall dot model. Okay. This is really easy. So resiliency equals tilde RS1 plus RS2. I'm gonna cheat a little bit here plus RS3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. If I can hit the right keys, 13, 14. So one factor model. 
So we just set everything equal or onto that one latent variable. Whoopee. Let's try that again. All right. Now what? Let's CFA this. So we're going to do overall.fit. This is just a regular old CFA, sort of. Pupper dog. Okay, sorry. Overall.model. Okay. Data equals resiliency.data. Now, because we're doing multi group models, we want to make sure we turn on the mean structure. It's not actually totally necessary here, but it is helpful if you're comparing oranges to oranges. No error messages. Whew. So let's create a summary of that overall.fit. Okay, R squared equals true. Spell out true here. Whoop. I am. This is why I don't like live coding. <laughs> Normally I actually can't type hardly at all. So <laughs> I'm doing better than I normally do. And standardized equals true. Oop. Okay. And here we just really like, is this model any good? Because right? a bad measurement model can't be fixed with a multi-group analysis. <laughs> now with the caveat here that if this model's bad, maybe it's because the white model's bad or the black model's bad. So we would still take the next step we're gonna do, but let's just see. Right, looks okay. RMC's good, uh, okay, RSRMR is good. Okay. I would look, here all my loadings are pretty strong, sixes and sevens. Um, here are my average scores, three to five, or basically four to five. Variance is all positive, R squared is all less than one. No crazy standard errors. Okay. And this is what we saw in the last lecture because it's the same data. <laughs> so slightly different because of gender, you know, had more data, I think, but the overall model is still okay. Now let's split that up and do a fit for our white participants. Uh, so we're just gonna do the same thing, model equals overall dot model, data equals res dot data, but we're gonna subset that and do ethnicity. We could do either one first, it doesn't really matter. A mean structure. I don't know why this doesn't come up. And then we'd run the same summary. So I'm just gonna not reinvent the wheel here. Aussie or do is the white data approximately the same? Eh, yeah, finity is not bad. Okay, yeah, acceptable. Both of our loadings are fine. Excuse me. Our variances are all positive here. Correlations or correlation R squared is less than one. So everything looks okay. Now, same thing, but for black participants, just to make sure that when we start to nest these models, we aren't gonna blow them up. Okay. And what would I consider bad here? Well, if one model is like fitting really nice, oops, black. And the other model has like half the finities are really poor. Um, or the loadings in one model are, are um, all zero. <laughs> that's not good. That's, that's time to stop and think about uh, how configural invariance probably isn't going to be met. Now, what about this model? Now this model has way less people, it's only 100. So we gotta be careful here because our sample size is smaller, but overall the model looks pretty good. So it's probably appropriate to put these two together because if one of them was radically different than the other, it would be a time to investigate why. And that's when you'd probably say, well, you know, they weren't gonna meet configural, in configural invariance because, you know, when we run them separately, it's pretty clear they're not the same thing. Now, I've already filled in the first one here, so I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna accidentally hit the wrong key, and then I'm gonna copy this. And just like in the MTMM video, what I'm doing here is I'm creating a empty matrix for myself to run. Now, when you're doing these on your own, you may not be know how many rows you need. 
So, it, you know, this isn't markdown. Just come back up here and edit it and rerun it. No big deal. So I'm gonna start with eight rows because I have done this assignment before and I know I need eight rows. And six columns, in my six columns, I'm gonna put the name of the model I'm testing, the chi-square, the degrees of freedom, CFI, RIMC, and SRMR. Okay, just give those column names. And, you know, this is like leftover from my old bad equals days. Then for the first row here, I'm gonna say, okay, the overall model is the name of the model I'm interested in. And then I'm gonna put in the fit indices and I'm just gonna round everything to three decimals because it's a little easier to read. Okay. And I put them in the same order so that my column name matches what data point I'm putting there. And you can put whatever you want. You can put TLI in here instead, but we're gonna use CFI as our uh, criteria. And then people usually report chi-square because if somebody wanted to do a chi-square difference test, they could look at your table and calculate it themselves, even though maybe you don't want to do it because you know it's biased by sample size. Okay. All right, so we're going to take that copy here and it says update here. So I'm going to fill this in and this is going to be white.fit. Okay, and then I'm going to fill this one in and it's going to be black.fit. So let's see how our table looks so far. Now, I don't, I don't know why it gives me twice. Okay. Um, if you want to print this out, you could do um, results equals as is, but I think this should be fine printing out as, uh, as we have it. And let's see, so we can compare. Our CFIs are all, you know, our overall model is the average of the, these two, although a little bit more probably biased towards white because there are more white participants overall, but you know, these are all pretty similar. Nothing too crazy running them separately. So does our overall model appear to fit okay and overall within each group? Yes, they seem pretty similar. Now, spelling similar correctly, let's try our configura configural invariance. And so all we have to do is create new fits because the model isn't changing. Okay. The data isn't changing. Mean structure equals true. That's not changing either. So now we're gonna add a new line. Group equals ethnicity. Okay. And that will allow us to test the ethnicity in our grouping variable. And then we also want to include our summary, which I'm gonna copy from up here so you don't have to listen to me type so much. And then last but very much not least, we're going to paste this into the table. Okay, where it says update here, we're going to do the same thing we did a minute ago. Do configural dot fit. What happens? Shoink. Now, I'm gonna get my big old huge long summary and I really should look at it, <laughs> right? So um, one problem I have with running these just as a whole block is you, you, you might totally miss if there's an error message. Okay. There isn't one, cool. Okay, now let's run the summary, kind of look at that. So once we nest those two bad boys together, we have, sorry, decent fit indices. I mean, TLI could be better here, RIMCs, Okay, SRMR is good. And then we have our group one here, which is black. And we can see that these all load pretty well. All of our variances are positive. All our standard errors are all approximately in the same kind of feel. You know, it's looking good. White here, all approximately pretty good. Sixes and sevens loading onto their latent variable. Our error variances are positive and not wild, right? And so, you know, everything seems okay without getting like too deep into the numbers. And then we plop that into our table and let's look at the table. Okay. Now we're still not comparing anything because now we've nested them together, nested them together like pancakes. Okay. And what I see here is acceptable fit indices. So let's move on and we'll start doing model comparisons. Now I am gonna copy all of this so I don't type too much. So let's change this to metric.fit. Okay. 
And all of this stays the same, but now we're going to do group dot equal okay. equals what's first? Uh, loadings. Sorry, brain fart. Loadings, intercepts, residuals. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Let's go look. You know, that's what the, the notes are for. Let's go down here to metric. Okay, loadings. Whew. I taught this last night. You think I would remember? <laughs> all right, so let's see. Uh, this all looks good. I'm going to copy from up here. Again, work smarter, not harder. Now let's run this. Run it. No error messages. Good news. Run that. All right, so now we're setting our loading is equal to each other. And we don't really see much of a change at all. That's good. Okay, You might see a drop in fit, but we were hoping it's not a big drop in fit. So now we've set the loadings equal to each other. So 1.22, 1.22. Do notice that gives you slightly different standardized all, but um, that's mostly because, you know, the way that it's standardizing the model, each model, each group has got a slightly different um, set of variances and that kind of stuff. Um, as we constrain the models more and more, we'll see that these start to line up together. But right now, the only thing we've set to equal are these loadings. All right, now into my table. Show me the table. What we're gonna do is compare these two CFIs directly. They're exactly the same. So by constraining the loadings, we haven't changed model fit. That's good. That implies that our loadings are invariant. Very cool. And that our configuration is invariant as well. Let's try scalar now. I'm just gonna cut and paste all this stuff because it's the same thing each time. So once you build it once, use that code. We're going to add here our intercepts. So now we're going to set the item averages together uh, to be equal. So do people in each group start in the same place? Are their intercepts the same? No error messages. Checking out this model. Oh, there is a drop here, but is it enough? And if so, where is it at? And, you know, nothing jumps out at me at the moment, model-wise. Right? They all look kind of, it kind of hasn't changed. So we just, I'm just kind of simply scrolling through these right now, not to bore you to tears. Um, in my real models, I would investigate these numbers a little bit more. But basically, here in the summary, I just want to make sure that, like, nothing has gotten large. And generally, if the first couple steps are okay, these will be as well, but the place to really keep an eye on is standard errors. Because if something kind of goes askew, you'll get an error message if there's a negative variance, but the um, if suddenly one of your standard errors becomes eight times the size it was earlier, I picked a random number there, but you know, six times the size, whatever, um, that's not a good sign. Something went wrong. Okay. Let's throw this in the table and look at our table. So. 912 and 902. This is why I do three decimals. That is technically 0.01. And the rule is greater than a 0.01 change. So if it's right on 0.01, what I tend to do with three decimals is call it good. Okay. I would consider these equivalent. Now, I'm a big fan of never say marginally significant or approaching significance. Please don't do that. Um, you know, if you're going to have a rule, stick to your rule. And if you wanted to, you could decide that these two are not equivalent and look for reasons why. But if I'm going to say my rule is greater than 0.01, this is not greater than 0.01, and I'm going to move on. Okay. And there's some newer arguments over what the cutoff score should actually be. Um, you know, that's a tough one. You know, some people suggest this should be 0.005. Uh, I would say that many models would not meet these criteria. Uh, some people suggest a sliding scale. You know, there's a bunch of ideas here, but 
you know, for better or worse, we were using 0.01. Alright, now let's add our strict variance here. Last model, well, the last part of this anyway. <laughs> and then let's copy this one too at the same time. Okay, last one to add right here is residuals. Let's do it. No error messages. Cool beans. Run the model. Okay. Ooh, that's definitely gonna be bad. So, do I see anything wild? Nah. Look at those standard errors. All nice point ones, right? R squareds look fine. All these nice even numbers. All right. So, overall, model looks okay. Now, looking at our table, I can tell even before I get here, point nine oh. 0.02 to 0.886 is definitely greater than 0.01, but I could say 0.902 minus 0.886 if I just want to do the math, and I'm at 0.016. Well, crap, now I need to do something, right? So question, looking at your results, okay, there should be like answer here. Question, looking at your results, do you see anything that indicates a uh, non-invariance, i.e. it has a larger change than CFI equals 0.01? Yes. The strict model was different from the scalar model. So we don't meet strict invariance, which, you know, is kind of a hard one to meet, I think. So, but maybe we can meet partial invariance. So let's try that. And I'm definitely gonna copy this. <laughs> so I'm gonna come over here to our lecture and show you some code that I wrote at some point in life to help me figure out um, where the problem is. And this is what what measurement invariance function used to do so beautifully, rip measurement invariance function. And um, also it wasn't super great in the equal test MI. So, you know, you would think that what you could do it's just, go, okay, on my last model here, modification indices, right? Um, on our strict dot fit, let's do sort, start, sort equals true, true, there we go. And you could just look at, okay, there's a lot of them, <laughs> let's view them. You just kind of look at them and figure it out. Well, it doesn't actually do any of them by group. <laughs> well, it kind of does, group equals two, right? Um, so let's see here. So I've got group equals one and group equals two, but it's, you know, this is, which one should I use? It's maybe not super clear. You know, this is a cross correlation, like which path should I release? So, you know, it's not helpful. Eh. Especially in the pa section that we're interested in. So, you know, close that, go away. So instead what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna test them one at a time and kind of use the leave one out principle. So test my model with the first path free, then the second path free, then the third path free. And if you don't remember what that means is at this moment, we have set all of these paths to be equal. The configuration is equal by nesting them together. The loadings are equal by setting up metric invariance. The intercepts are equal by setting up scalar invariance, and the residuals are equal by setting up strict invariance. So we have a pretty tightly controlled model. But we found that strict invariance didn't work, so what we need to do is figure out which items, residuals, are different between groups. And that will allow me to see if I can do partial invariance. So maybe it's just one or two of those items. And the best way to test that is to just try them one at a time. Now one at a time here because one of them may change the whole model. It may just be one of them. Or it may be such that um, once you do one, it changes what the other ones are. So what I did here was I wrote some code to paste together to make the, the Levon syntax. Because essentially what we want to do is we want to say, okay, RS1 is what our first item. 
and we want to see about the correlation with itself. Okay, this is how you write a residual variance, okay, because these are the measured items. And so that code is the residual variance for item one. And what we've done before with our Haywood cases is we said, okay, well, the residual variance is actually 1.22 right, times. And this is how we could set something if we had a Haywood case. But in this scenario, I'm basically saying I want to test if that one should be different between groups. So you're essentially saying that RS1 should be non-equal between groups. But that could take a long time to type them all, especially if you had 45 of them or something. So speaking from experience, what, what I'm doing here is I took the names of the, or call names rather, these are, it's the same thing, but either way, um, of the data. And I say, okay, it's columns three. Ooh, I'm gonna have to fix that in my notes. I changed this data set, so it's actually columns three through 16. To remember to leave this open like, remind myself to fix it because I changed the data. Now there's actually some other cool ways that you can do this. If you um, if you like regular expressions, this is one thing I have done. It looks crazy. So I want all the column names in my residual data. Where are those column names? It's grep L. And the pattern that we want to do is RS, because they all start with RS. Okay? So I could do um, starts with RS. Okay? So this is a regular expression. I want to say starts with RS. And we want to look in the column names of our data. This is going to look crazy. Give me just a second. Um, hopefully we'll make this clear. Um, I can't tell if it's easier to read it spread out or not over here. Let's make this bigger. There we go. So let me copy this real quick. Show you what's happening. So here, if we scroll down and look at it, what this does is it takes each column name. <laughs> All right, so here are all our column names. Sex, ethnicity, RS1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? And it says, you know what? Does that column name start with RS? Okay, this only works in data sets where you have specific column name rules like this. Okay? It says false, false, because they don't, and then trues. And so what I've done is stuck that here in some square brackets right, as, a, as a subsetting rule. And said, so, you know what? Give me back all the column names that start with RS. So let's just look at that. And so it prints them out. Cool. And then what I want to do is say, okay, paste that column name with a residual, tilde, tilde, and itself. So I'm going to paste the same thing again. Okay. So find me all the column names that start with RS and paste them with themselves. So that's another way to do this. You can also do it this first way if that makes more sense to you. But this is the more flexible way where you don't have to know where they're hidden in the data set. So what did that look like? Okay. So now we have RS tilde tilde RS1, RS2 tilde tilde RS2, etc. So these are all the possible residuals that we could change. Cool. I'm going to create myself a placeholder CFI list. It's not very exciting. All it is is a count variable here. Okay. So we're going to run this 14 times. I could make 14 NAs, works the same. And we're going to give them names. So let's look at what that looks like now. Those names will just help me in a minute find which one I'm running. Cool. Now I'm going to use a loop. I know you are enthusiasts, you don't love loops, but hey, I could pretend to be Python for a minute, and the answer in everything in Python is always a loop. So let's loop over this. I'm gonna loop i times, because I learned Perl first, <laughs> from one to the total number of partial syntaxes I wanna run, so 14. So it's gonna run the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one. Right. And I'm gonna run my CF, uh, CFA model. Okay, this is the same model we just ran, except now, um, we're doing ethnicity. 
<laughs> this model wasn't going to work very well. Okay. And here's the specialized code to relax or free up that parameter. So group.partial says for RS1, whatever, let them do whatever they want. They don't have to be equal. Okay. Now the I here just tells me which version of the loop is. So first round. So we'll do number one, then number two, then number three, then number four. Okay. So depending on how good your computer is, this can take a minute to run. Uh, oh, it helps if you spell ethnicity right. It runs real fast, we give an error message. Done faster than I could take a sip of my soda. All right, let's look at our CFI list. And these are all the CFIs for that model with that parameter relaxed. Remember from our table up here, our um, overall one was 0.886. So we wanna get ourselves up to, uh, let's see here. So our, um, sorry, let's rerun this. I lost what I was thinking. Uh, we're trying to get up to a, me a measure for a scalar. So we'd say 0 0.902 minus 0 0.01, and that's, we're trying to get to 0 0.892. Well, I could find here whichever one meets that criteria, which you will see is none of them. So I might have to do this twice. Or I could just say, you know what, tell me the largest one, which is RS3. Cool. I'm going to use that information to now rerun my model and free up that parameter. All right, let's go up here. I'm just gonna actually copy all of this. Well, okay, not this piece. Paste it down here. Down to update, we're gonna do um, group dot uh, partial equals, and we would copy our RS3 here, but I'll just type it. I'm going to call it strict 2, so I have it saved as a separate model, and then I'm going to put that information into my table. Two. Okay, that's one too many. Close parentheses. There we go. Let's see what happens. No error messages. I run a summary of strict two. Oh, we're so close, but that doesn't quite get me there. It's 0 0.890, darn it. Okay, well, fine, let's just run this and look at the table. Okay. So we're at 0 0.890 and we're trying to get up to 0 0.902 minus 0 0.1, so 0.892. And so we may have to run one more item. Okay, so we can call this partial model RS3. Let's try that whole thing again. So I'm going to copy this code block and stick it down here and we'll come back to um, these questions here in a second. And you know I don't need any of this stuff anymore because basically we've already done it once, we don't have to do it again. And so my partial syntax here, I'm going to add in what I just added, so RS3 tilde tilde rs3 plus this new one okay now in a minute it's going to do rs3 and rs3 so it'll do it twice but it levon will mostly ignore that it just kind of thinks you're dumb but um you know that one is rs3 by itself so you don't really have to recreate your partial syntax by excluding that one but you can if you want I think the, the amount of time it takes to run these is so small that running the, one of them again that I don't need to is not a big deal. All right, let's see what happens now. So I type everything right. Looks like it. So quick. Which max now? RS7. Now the good thing about looking at this is that, um, you know, you could see that are very, two that are very close. These two are very close, right? 0 0.8923, 0 0.8928, 0 0.8925, 0 0.8928, 0 0.8929, 0 0.8930, 0 0.8931, 0 0.8932, 0 0.8933, 0 0.8933, 0.8933, 0.8933, 0.8933, 0.8933, 0.8933, 0.8933, 0.8933, 0.8933, 0.8933, 0.8933, 0.8933, 0.8933, 0.8933, 0.8933, 
So then now I would copy this code block and make strict number three. Add in our RS7. Notice here that it's a, a new part of our concatenate and not just um, in the same text area. Like it's not typed here. It's typed as a separate free up of the partials. My table fit, I need a knife throw. So don't try to run this because it'll get mad at you. But eh, you know what, let's just try it. So you can see it's gonna be like, hey now, that subscript is out of bounds. What are you doing? There's only eight rows. Easy enough. Scroll, 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 because we haven't knitted this together yet. In row equals nine. Fixed. Now, I will, to fix that, we'll need to rerun everything. So we'll just let it all rerun for a second. And this is why I love Markdown. Happiest thing ever. Okay. That one, go away. That one. Okay, it still says RS7 is the one, so I know I'm doing something right. Hey, I would kind of scroll through all this, but let's just paste it into our table. And now we can see, um, did I do that right? Oh, no. Wait, why didn't it go up? <laughs> that should have gone up. 0.89 again. Hold on, let's look at this. Let's see. 0.89, that did not improve my model. Did I miss something somewhere? Hmm. <laughs> Let's see here. So we've got our strict fake two. It should go up, right? Our CFI list. So with R7, we should get 0.892 with these two together. Huh. All right, now I have my two partial fits. So let's look at our output and make sure it actually ran that correctly. What did I do wrong? Huh. RS37 did not get freed. <laughs> oh, because I typed it wrong. That did not give me an error. That's really interesting. Hold on, let's see. Yep, I did not get an error message there. Well, that's my own silly fault. So you should get you should get numbers that are better. <laughs> it ignored me because it's like, what you doing, honey? All right. 0.892 rounded up. Okay. Phew, so I've used this example for years. <laughs> Why did it stop working? Okay, and we see 0.893. So does that bring us up to partial invariance? Remember you compare this to the scalar model, not this strict model, basically this strict model, and that strict model don't count, but we are partial invariance model now comes up to close enough to being, to being equivalent. Okay. So does the freeing of this one parameter bring your model up? Nope. But if we add RS7, we see an, a partially invariant fit. Okay. What does the result of our partial invariance imply for interpreting this scale? Okay, this is a little harder. We need to go back and look at the summary. So let's see, RS3 here for our first group, which is black participants, um, has a variance of three. And R7 has a variance of two. So I'm just gonna kind of copy this since there's so much output here. It's the only bad thing about Levon, honestly, which isn't a problem with Levon, actually, it's a problem with sim overall. A lot of variant, a lot of a lot of stuff. And then we're gonna copy the other participants, the white participants here. And I, I told students, like, if it's going to break down, it's going to be at scalar. And now I'm showing you two strict examples. But, you know, it can go, it can go bad at any step. Let me close this. Now, what does the result imply? Okay, so this is black participants. And this is white. And I'm just pasting this for us to be able to read it. So what I would say is that black participants show more heterogeneous, uh, I think, no, answers 
four, resiliency scale three, and resiliency scale seven. I would have to go look at what those items are. Then white participants. Okay. This implies that they are um, answering items with, oh gosh, spelling, with a uh, wider range of values. which suggests a flatter distribution or more variable distribution than white participants. Okay. And let's see, I have a scale on my computer. I think I have it saved somewhere on here. I have a whole bunch of other nonsense on here. Where is that scale? Might be called RS14. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I have all of the examples over the years. There it is. <laughs> Let's see what that is. Okay. So item number three is, I usually take things in stride. And item number seven is, I can get through difficult times because I've experienced difficulty before. Okay. And so black participants pick a wider range of values on those questions. This is a one to seven scale. So they have the same intercept, meaning the same mean. It's just that black participants are more heterogeneous in their answering. Um, so they give a wider range of answers to that, to that item. Most of the averages here are, are hover around four. And with a variance of three, we're talking that's that's a lot, right? That's a lot of variability on either side. Um, so I can usually take, I usually take things in stride, has a lot of variance in it. Okay. So there's a little more error in understanding our black participants than our white participants. Okay. And most of this data is collected. Um, it's simulated from studies that my friend friends have run. And so, um, you know, this is, based on studies that occur after a natural disaster. And that makes a lot of sense um, that there are more variability in the answers. It's an E, heterogeneous. There we go. Thank you, spell check in our studio. <laughs> okay. And so all that taken together is an interpretation and work through of a multi-group model using just Lavon. So no extra packages necessary and building everything and putting it in a kind of a nice um, table and cable. It's not meant to rhyme really. Let's look at that, how that looks when you print it out. Cable has some really great HTML outputs and there's a cable extra package that also allows you to make them even fancier in um, HTML output. I am not that fancy. Um, flex table again is also a really great way to view this stuff. So, but man, it, is, it prints real nice, doesn't it? <laughs> so these are much easier to read. Um, so often I will knit these as I go, just so I can kind of visualize and look at what my results are suggesting to me. Okay. So altogether, that is a multi-group model with just Levon.